Kobe Bryant was one of the best players to ever lace up a basketball shoe. What those people went through and how did they manage to come out of it and be so coherent and clear and positive. I mean, it's an amazing tribute to the human spirit. Yeah, I wanted to be going places where few people went before, operating complex machines and help um, gather data that helps make life better. Mm. And in particular, that's why we go into space, to make life better on Earth. I mean, there's a part of me which kind of likes the sort of, uh, I like perversity. The world was stunned earlier this week to learn of the tragic death of LA Lakers star Kobe Bryant. The basketball legend was killed in a helicopter crash along with his daughter Gianna and seven others. Nicknamed Black Mamba, he was one of the greatest NBA players of all time. I spoke to British-born former Laker Steve Bucknell about what made Kobe Bryant such a giant of the game. Kobe Bryant was one of the best players to ever lace up a basketball shoe. I mean, the, his, his legacy is, is, is all written down and documented, and he meant so much to the sport, so much to the Laker nation, and so much to the, the sporting nation in the whole. Uh, a whole. A great tragedy. Your work with Basketball England now, how does Kobe Bryant inspire the next generation of players? What's his legacy? What's his impact? I think what I'll highlight about Kobe, as, as we've talked about before, is, is his his work ethic, his, his truly incredible work ethic and meticulous uh, eye for details. I think all our young players need to pay attention. He, did, he didn't just get to the top by waking up one morning and picking up a basketball. He really worked hard at it. And I think it proves that if you have some talent and you, and you dedicate yourself to, to hard work and listening to your coaches, and having good people around you, you can be successful. And I think all kids need to, to look at his life, look at what, what he's done for basketball, not just during his playing days, but even now he set up his academy, he's working with the young people. He's, he's somebody that, that really wants to leave a mark and has left a mark in basketball forever. And he was a one-team man as well. He went straight from high school into the NBA and he was with the LA Lakers throughout and he had so much success with that one team. I think the loyalty, uh, we don't talk about that now in sports, but, you know, he was, he was loyal to the Lakers. He, uh, I believe he went there at 18, 19 years old, and he never left. And he, he stuck with that program through his ups and downs, mostly ups, of course, with the five championships. But he was a stalwart, and they, and they built a foundation on that that's taken him through now, and LeBron James is trying to carry that on. Uh, talk to me about the impact on that city. He really was a giant in L.A., yeah, playing basketball for the Lakers is, is a tremendous honor and the whole city gets behind you and, you know, the Laker Nation gets behind you and, and Kobe has, has been seen for over two decades as the, the, the number one sportsman out there. So his impact is, is devastating to see what's happened now with his passing away. People are still trying to comprehend it, I think. People can't believe it. I'm still in shock. And, uh, you know, we, we need to mourn. We need time to mourn and understand this, this guy was one of the greatest. More now on the 75th anniversary of the liberation of Auschwitz, which was marked today with a ceremony featuring some of the survivors of the death camps. Joining me now is Lord Dubs, our Labour peer, of course, who was a child escaped the Nazis and came to the United Kingdom. Very good to see you, Lord Dubs. Do you often think, as you watch scenes such as we've seen today at Auschwitz, what would, what might have happened to your family, your immediate family, if you hadn't been able to get out of Czechoslovakia? Yeah, I suppose I, suppose I do. I mean, my uncle and aunt ended up in Auschwitz, uh, so I do. My, my parents were lucky, they, 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 but by different means they escaped that. But I certainly do think about it, and pretty well most of our family either fled, the, fled Czechoslovakia or ended up in the camps, mm. uh, friends and family and so on. Let's just fill people in uh, who don't know your, your story. I mean, you really, you and you, as I say, your immediate family, got out in the nick of time. My father fled the day the Germans occupied Prague in March 1939, and then my mother was refused permission to leave, and she put, got me on a kinder transport, so I arrived 
in London in July 1939, which was, after all, two months before the war began. Mm. What do you make uh, of the testimony we've been hearing today from some of the, the last survivors? Well, but pretty soon there aren't going to be anyone, isn't going to be anyone left who were actually in the council. No, I found some of the testimonies I've heard today and earlier very painful. And, and I think what, what those people went through and how did they manage to come out of it and be so coherent and clear and positive. I mean, it's an amazing tribute to the human spirit. But of course, so many of them, uh, so many of their friends and relatives didn't survive. So there's that terrible tragedy overhanging it all. Mm, so how do we keep that, that memory going and the lessons that emanate from it? Publicity, such as you're doing, thank, thanks, thanks to this. The Holocaust Memorial Day Trust had, uh, has had events. Uh, I've been to two or three of them today. Big one at, at um, Central Hall Westminster, where the, uh, uh, the royal family, where the Prince William was there and so on. Uh, and I think we have to do it in schools as well. I think we have to make sure that young people understand what's happening. And some of the uh, organisations that perpetuate uh, the, the message or spread the message. They have young people who are ambassadors who go to schools, go on schools and telling them. I think we've got to educate the young people. Mm -hmm. I was at a school in Bethnal Green about two years ago, uh, maintained school, but it was all Muslim boys. And their project was the Holocaust and kinder transport. And one of the Muslim boys said to me, what do I say to somebody who denies the Holocaust ever happened? I think that's a terrific tribute to that school. Mm -hmm. Terrific that Muslim boys are asking those sort of sensible far-reaching questions. Well, I'd like to say that the Antarctic explorer, Jenny Davis, joins us now in the studio. Um, been there a couple of times now? Yes, second trip. When, did you, when did you get back? Um, about a week ago, yeah. Um, unfortunately, I've been a uh, short stint in hospital since getting back, but I'm now out and very excited to be let out. <laughs> so you were trying to get to the pole. Um, you tried last year, a couple yeah. of years ago, and had health problems that stopped you. You tried again. You didn't, you didn't break the record you were hoping to break. Yes, so the record I was going for was the solo uh, speed record to go from the coastline of Antarctica to the South Pole, which is 700 miles. And the women's record, which still stands, and I really hope there's someone at home watching who'd like to come and break it, um, and I'll be there helping them every step of the way. Um, but I did it in 42 days, um, so just shy. I was on pace for the world record for um, 420 miles, just over. Um, and unfortunately, when I got this injury on my leg, uh, it was called polar thigh, which is a form of kind of cold injury. I slowed right down. So the skiing went from 16 hours a day to about 14. Um, I was in a great deal of pain. Um, but the goal was to reach the pole, and I did that. So I'm, I'm genuinely overjoyed that I did. Why go? Why do it? I think if you have to ask. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I don't know. There's so many answers, long answers to that question. Um, it's something I wanted to do since I was a teenager. Um, I followed um, Antarctic history since then. Um, I've seen other women do it. Um, and I've looked up to them in a big way um, and it's just something I've always wanted to go and do. It's a long time to be by yourself and um, I get that 42 days and the solitude's never been the issue for me. Um, I really wanted to see what I could do out there. It's been 200 years since, since it was discovered in the vertical commas, it's obviously yeah. been there for a great deal longer than that. Um, so much research has been carried out. I mean, is there anything left to learn from Antarctica? So much of Antarctica has not been explored um, and maybe there's an argument to be made that it should stay that way. Um, but yeah, it's such an enormous country. I think people realise just how big it really is. Um, but yeah, I think it still has a lot left to offer um, in terms of exploration. Will you go again? I mean, you've, you've given it a go twice. Um, yeah, so the first time I had a bowel infection, I was medevaced with peritonitis, and that was uh, far more serious than what's happened with my leg this time. Um, no, I don't know. <laughs> It's I'm sworn early, I would not go back. Um, <laughs> but you're already thinking about it. It's something that draws you back to Antarctica, and I just can't explain it. Well, the first time I was there, I made it quite clear this is the one and only time I'd be going to Antarctica. It's expensive to go to um, as a tourist, which I guess ultimately I am, uh, even as a polar explorer. Um, and I find myself back there again. Um, so, yeah, maybe in some shape or form, whether it's as a guide or, or doing trips there, we'll see. But I can't imagine it's my last time. actually since NASA launched the last man's shuttle flight but now the agency has big plans 
for the future. With us is Steve Smith. He's a former shuttle mission specialist and one of NASA's most experienced astronauts. Thank you very much for having me today. Tell me about Atlantis. Atlantis is uh, one of our uh, space shuttles that we've retired now, as you mm -hmm. said. This one's located at the Kennedy Visitor Complex in Florida, so our guests can see that. Um, that's the shuttle I flew on on my last flight to fix or to build the Hubble on um, the International Space Station. Wow, amazing, yeah. amazing. Do you miss being in space? I do. I dream about it two or three times per year. Yeah. Do a spacewalk or steal a jet and go flying. <laughs> uh, I always wake up and tell my wife I was in space again. So. Uh, but you've, you haven't been to the moon, have you? No, no, no one's been to the moon since the early 1970s, mm -hmm. but we're going back, as you may know. So there's this effort to be back on the moon within the next four or five years. Mm. And I think we'll see the first woman step on the moon at that time, well, too. I sincerely hope so. What happened in that decade when, when uh, the shuttles were retired? Sure. So um, it would have been nice to have had the follow-on spacecraft available right away when the shuttle was done. But because of all the challenges we have in our funding, we um, are still working on the new one. So in the meantime, we've been riding on Russian rockets um, to get our, our astronauts to the moon and European astronauts like Timothy Peake. Um, and so now the new vehicle is just about ready. And so that's what we hope to fly on within the next um, year, actually, just to go in low Earth orbit and then back to the moon after that. Why do we want to go back to the moon? Well, there's um, a lot of things that we weren't able to do back in the 1970s because we didn't have the technology in terms of research. But the real main point is that the moon is fairly close to Earth. So it's about a three-day trip. And if we want to go on to Mars, the moon is a great place to practice things and to try new technology. But getting to Mars is years, isn't uh, it's it? It's very difficult. Yeah, it's very difficult. Um, I think the technology will be ready in the next few years, but it takes about nine months to get there and to go back. And to put a human in space for that long would be over two years because you want to stay at Mars for a while. The human body just can't take it. So that's the big challenge. Mm -hmm. Why did you want to be an astronaut? Oh, I grew up uh, under the influence of the explorers of the day, Jacques Cousteau and all the um, astronauts and cosmonauts. And for me, I wanted to be going places where few people went before, operating complex machines and help um, gather data that helps make life better. Mm -hmm. And in particular, that's why we go into space to make life better on Earth. Now, for 16 years, he's been the soundtrack to the England cricket team. Now, the Barmy Army's trumpeter is retiring. The current test against South Africa will be the last time Billy Cooper entertains England fans with his well-known hits. Well, I'm joined from central London by the former England cricketer, Monty Panesar. Monty, really good to talk. It does put a smile on your face. Um, your reaction to the news that uh, Billy Cooper is uh, hanging up the trumpets? Yeah, I think Billy Cooper was, you know, was the kind of the face for, you know, Barmy Army. And uh, I think, you know, they're the best supporters, you know, in the world. And and I'm sure, you know, the songs that he, that they've uh, that he's created and, uh, um, you know, numerous wickets, you know, that he's helped us get, you know, during tough situations in a, in a test match. You know, we, we thank Billy Cooper and, uh, you know, he's been uh, absolutely brilliant, you know, for Barmy Army and, uh, you know, for cricket fans uh, around the world. What can you tell me about the atmosphere that he uh, contributed to? I think when uh, things were going, when there was nothing going on, um, he, we would hear the trumpet and uh, it would get the get the crowd going, get, get us going, you know, um, uh, we, we provide us with a, a lot of energy, passion, and then suddenly, you know, it will lift our spirits. And, and once we get a wicket, suddenly uh, we're on a roll. And uh, he was brilliant at that. You know, he was absolutely brilliant at, uh, you know, providing uh, a lot of uh, sort of entertainment, a lot of support. And... Um, you know, he first obviously became famous in 2005, you know, during the, during the Ashes uh, when England won. And, and since then, you know, Barmy Army has just gone, you know, strength to strength. Yeah, um, you often hear from professional um, sports personalities that you can't underestimate um, the importance um, of the crowd. And uh, Billy was one of those people that inspired that crowd to, to support you and, and your teammates. Yeah, absolutely. I thought Billy was, uh, you know, um, just brilliant, you know, loyal, loyal supporter. And I think at times, you know, I remember when I needed a wicket, you know, Billy Cooper helped me out a lot. And I'm sure he's helped, you know, many numerous, you know, test bowlers, uh, test captains. So, you know, we just thank him. Thank him, you know, for the effort and uh, for his passion and his commitment on uh, supporting, you know, English cricket. How long have we been on this rock? Five weeks? Two days? This film is so unique. Tell me what went through your mind when the script came to you. What were your first thoughts? I thought it was very original. 
um, and I'd been I was l reading a lot of scripts at the time, and it just really, really, really stood out. And I wanted to work with Robert anyway. So I really liked him, and I loved The Witch, and there was just something so fascinating about it, and it was it's really ambitious and really. Um, it felt very well researched and very. It, it just felt like a world when you read it, and um, and it's and also when you get these characters doing it's such extreme behaviour, like it's really you just knew it'd be really fun to play. You have some really intimate scenes, and I'm intrigued as an actor. How do you break down those barriers and perform such extreme kind of in-depth things that normally in everyday life we just don't do? I mean, there's a part of me which kind of likes the sort of... Uh, I like perversity in something. You kind of think... I don't know, I think a lot of people like to play things pretty safe. And, like, once you've, once you've kind of broken that fear of, uh, like, oh, what will people think if I do this or whatever, and you just do it once, and then you're like... Let Neptune strike you dead, Winslow! It's like, now I don't... I realise I don't actually care what people think. <laughs> And it's like, and it's fun, and there's something when you can kind of the crazier something is. Um, I don't know, especially when it when it works like this. I mean, people, you know, you can people come out of a movie theater being like, "What was that?" I mean, it's kind of it's an exciting feeling. Like you know, just sort of that's just the world I want to I want to be part of. And it's also I never really see something as this. There's something. Weirdly protected about doing it in a movie, doing almost anything in a movie, even though more people will see it. Like, it's like there's just that little strange line where it's like, it's not real. And it's like, but it is real. <laughs> like, it's, it's really bizarre. I'm a lot more confident if there's a camera there than if there isn't, which is bizarre. All right, have a joy. The last fighter ace of the Battle of Britain has died, meaning just two of the so-called few are still known to be alive. Wing Commander Paul Farns died peacefully in hospital in Sussex on Tuesday morning, aged 101. He was one of 3,000 airmen who defended the skies against the Luftwaffe over southern England in the summer of 1940. I'm joined from Kent by Patrick Tootle from the Battle of Britain Memorial Trust. He was a proper ace, wasn't he? Destroying, what, six enemy aircraft and I think damaged six as well. That's, Is that right? That's right. And, of course, he was also an ace in the Battle of France as well. He became an ace after he shot down five aeroplanes. You got to know him and his family. What sort of man was he? Oh, a very gentle man. I mean, he, he didn't suffer fools gladly. He hated bureaucracy. But on the other hand, he was very kind and he really engaged with everybody. I mean, his great pride was his family and also coming to events and sort of being re represented there. He, he sometimes felt a bit embarrassed when they all clapped when we left Westminster Abbey. Now, Patrick, since you retired from the RAF, you've dedicated your life to making sure the Battle of Britain is remembered, presumably it gets more difficult as these heroes pass on. Yes, that's a popular conception, but we found as they pass on, uh, a new generation gets involved, not the immediate post-war generation like I was, but um, young people today, and particularly the grandchildren and all the rest, are very involved now, and when we go to schools and they come round, they're incredibly interested, so there's no no waning of the interest in the Battle of Britain, which was so, so important to this country and perhaps the world. We wouldn't be celebrating VE Day in May if we hadn't won the Battle of Britain. Absolutely. And, uh, but they do take their stories with them, don't they? What other ways, Patrick, can you make sure that these men are not forgotten? Well, very early on, when we set up our wing, our new visitor centre, um, in about 2010, we did a series of interviews with about 12 of them who were still with us and could um, speak well. So we've got those in our archives, and we'll ha keep those to play to our visitors when they come and see us. A school in Hampshire has teamed up with a Ugandan orphan kids' choir to give them a chance to come to the UK, perform 
and raise awareness about their life. Brighton Hill School in Basingstoke raised nearly £10,000 to bring these children all the way over from Uganda. And over the past couple of weeks, the King's Kid Choir have sung at some pretty impressive locations, including Westminster Hall. And I'm very pleased to say that the choir are with me now. Hello to you. Hello. Big smiles and some big voices as well. You should have heard them in rehearsal. Uh, also here, headmaster of Brighton Hill School, Chris Edwards, and Robert Maponier, who's the lead pastor at King's Kid Ministries International, who came here to the UK with this rather wonderful choir. Uh, well, welcome to you all. Um, Chris, I first want to ask how this special relationship between your school in Hampshire came about with the orphanage in Uganda. Yeah, well, one of our governors is uh, the reverend of the local Baptist church and he knew Robert and he brought Robert over and I took the opportunity to get Robert to do an assembly with our year eights at the time. And we were quite moved by the story of, of the choir. And at the end of his assembly, I got up and promised that we'd raise enough money to fly them over without really thinking about it and sort of hope they might forget about it. But <laughs> then he emailed me and told me, he told the children and that there were tears of joy. So we couldn't really go back. So our children and staff have raised £9,000 to, um, to fly these guys over here, but it's been worth every penny. Tell me about the orphanage and some of the work you do there. Well, thank you. Uh, uh, the King's Kid uh, is, a, is, a, is a whole ministry, but specifically the children's, or children's home. Mm. We, we, we work with over uh, 300 children that uh, have, uh, otherwise have not parents or their parents are dysfunctional families. And we take care of them on a full-time basis, feeding them, dressing them, and giving them an education. Robert, I understand the children are going to, to sing for us. Uh, what, what song are they singing? Oh, they have a wonderful uh, um, um, a cappella called the Hallelujah, so they're going to sing that. Well, let's yeah. take it away, shall we? All praises. 